Welcome. Good day, everyone. We'd like to especially thank you and welcome you to today's program, 10 Conversations You Must Have With Your Children. We pray that each and every one of you will be highly impacted and young lives will be transformed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So who are we? School of Parenting was founded in 2004 under the Ministry of Daystar Christian Center to equip parents to raise children the right way. In view of the unique and involving challenges slash influences we confront today, we must deploy our Christian beliefs and godly wisdom to raise our children the right way and not just follow the stereotype of how we were raised. Our vision is to help parents raise godly children who will be a blessing to their generation and beyond. Our mission is to create an interactive forum where parents can learn biblical principles and practical steps for bringing up godly children. We have since inception treated a wide spectrum of topics, which include but not limited to basic parenting course, prenup, Keeping managing your child's sexuality, building an heritage, a hedge around your children. We minister to specific parenting needs, ranging from single parenting, parenting special need children, and parenting teenagers. Who can join us? Our members are parents and intending parents who are passionate about the overall development of children, spiritual, physical, mental, emotional, and ethical. While we do not claim monopoly of knowledge in the field of parenting, we're a group of people who believe that being intentional is a vital requirement of good parenting and have committed ourselves to improving our parenting skills. We hold monthly meetings where, we talk, where a talk is delivered, followed by an interactive session with questions and contribution taken from the attendees. Attendance is open to parents, grandparents, guidance, single parents, singles, and any person who is interested in learning how to bring up the total child. To join the School of Parenting faculty, you must have completed the 200 level of Daystar Academy. House rules, kindly post all questions in the chat room. This will be collated by the moderator as you send them. Do your best to post questions related to the topic being discussed. All questions will be collated and answered by the panelists during the interactive session. Kindly state the ages of your children so the answers can be tailored appropriately. If you have testimonies of how school of parenting program have changed your life, kindly post them on the chat room. Your feedback is much appreciated. All participants will be muted to manage noise interference. And if you wish to speak with a counselor, please send a private message to the designated counselor during the session. Once again, thank you and sit back and enjoy yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Tola Ogunleye, for that introduction. So now that we are all up to speed, we can go into the program proper. Um, today's topic, as we mentioned earlier, and as you probably know, is 10 conversations you must have with your children. Of course, conversations with children are essential and they tend to start from very early age. Sometimes those conversations even start while the children are still in the womb. I know that these days I hear of many cases where mothers speak to their children while they are still carrying them in the womb. And uh, there have been testimonies of people saying that sometimes the children actually respond, they feel a kick. Maybe, definitely not because they heard from their ears, but somehow a connection is made. And I, 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 I know I've seen a woman, for example, who tapped her stomach when the child was moving to my house. You know, and she said the movement uh, reduced. You know, so that is part of communication. But the communication we are focused on today is the, is the communication with the children when they are old enough to understand. And our speakers today will do uh, justice to why we need to have these conversations, the type of conversations we need to have, how, where, when, objectives, and so many things to do with these conversations in order to achieve positive outcomes. 
So our first speaker today is the Dean of the School of Parenting, no less, his brother Dayo Adebayo. Dayo Adebayo is a barrister and solicitor of the Supreme Court of Nigeria. He is the Dean of the School of Parenting. He is married to BC Adebayo, his sweetheart of about 28 years. And together they have three lovely adults and a blooming teenager, a blooming teenager. Together they call them the Fantastic Four. And uh, I, know, I know these children and adults. I have known them from when they were all children and they are indeed the Fantastic Four. Uh, wonderful, wonderful adults and wonderful child. So it is my pleasure to introduce Barista Dayo Adebayo. He's incidentally, I mean, when he said he's a sweetheart of 28 years, pulling his leg, I told him, I said, but I know you guys met from when you were in university. He, he quickly reminded me that in university we were good friends, but we've been sweethearts for 28 years. Mrs. Adebayo is also someone I know very well. She's a fantastic lawyer and fantastic person. It is my great pleasure to welcome Dayo Adebayo, the School of Parenting, to take the first session. Okay, I will go ahead to introduce Sister Ronke as well. Uh, Sister Ronke is Dr. Ronke Akinola. We fondly call her Duchess in the School of Parenting. Ronke Akiola is a pediatrician stroke pediatric endocrinologist. She is passionate with regards to children and parenting. She is, of course, a member of the faculty of the School of Parenting. She treats children with health issues and runs clinics for that purpose. She is a university lecturer of young adult medical students, and she is also an author. She is co-author of two parenting books, Baba, Our Young Old Man, and What My Children Need to Know Before They Leave Home. She is blessed. She and her husband, Jeremy, are blessed with three wonderful children as well. Again, three children I know very well. Wonderful children. The last of their children, I call her my friend. Whenever we see each other, I call her my friend. And she greets me more like a friend than like daddy's friend. Very wonderful children. So Sister Ronke Akiola, you are also welcome. So Dean, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to have um, the ladies and gentlemen on this platform today. When we'll be talking about 10 conversations you must have with your children. Definitely, there are several conversations you must have with them. But we are prioritizing these 10 because from experience as parents of young adults, we know that definitely this 10 will come handy. And that's why we are prioritizing the 10. What are conversations and why conversation? Well, to put it uh, in a mild form, a conversation is just a talk, you know, a very informal one between two people where views and ideas are exchanged. So it's not something that you say, hey, come and sit there, sit on the table. Then you begin to ram your ideas you know, down the throat of your children. That is not conversation. That is more like a command. You know? But conversation is exchanging of ideas views, that is conversation. And that is the way God wants us you know, to engage our children, not by just handing down commands, but by engaging them in very constructive conversation. Proverbs 22, six gives us a very good foundation. It says, train up a child in the way it should go. Even when he's old, he will not depart from it. I can tell you that it's almost impossible to train a child without engaging that child in constructive conversation. It's almost impossible, if not impossible. Judith Harvey uh, said this, and I'm going to quote. He said, talk to your child at every opportunity about everything 
and anything. So talk to your child at every opportunity about everything and anything. So every opportunity we have with our children, we should engage them in conversation. The beauty of it is that those conversations, they don't have to be monotonous because you can have them when you are having private moments with your children or with one of them or all of them. You can have it, you know, during your family meetups meetings. You can engage them in conversation. It could be when you are watching a movie, take them to a movie and after the movie or during the meeting, movie, you can start a conversation. It could be during Bible study, it could be during prayer time. I mean, something just comes up and you just want to share with your children or they ask a question. And that question, you will use it as a teachable moment to engage them in conversation. It could be when you are reading stories to your children because they want to ask some questions about the story. Then you can start a conversation you know, from their question. So it could be jokes and humor. In my family, we have some jokes that are very peculiar to us. Oh, if you're not a member of the family, you wouldn't even understand those jokes. Because those jokes came as a result of uh, you know, experience together. So we make fun of each other. They want to make fun of daddy. There are particular jokes about daddy. There are particular jokes about money. Then each of the children, they have their particular jokes. You know, once in a while, you know, somebody makes a slip, you know, and we can turn that slip into a joke. You know, so it's engaging all the way. Well, I want to talk about the story in Proverbs 31. It's a story of a king. He got to the throne and in retrospect, he was asking himself, you know, how did I get here? You know, what are the values that brought me here? Then he remembered you know, the words that his mother taught him. And I'm going to quickly read that. Proverbs 31 from 1. Said the words of King Nemuel, the utterance which his mother taught him. What my son, and what son of my womb, and what son of my vows, do not give your strength to women, nor your ways to that which destroy kings. It is not for kings, O Nimuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law, and pervert justice for all who are afflicted. Let me stop here. So the king, you know, was recalling the words of the mom and see the, the way he phrased it. You know, it was as if the mom was talking all over again. And you see, at the opening, you see the song coming three times. What's my son? What's my son? What's my son? I'm from the Yoruba tribe. And in the Yoruba tribe, when they want to tell you something that is very important, they call your name three times. And they, then they ask you, how many times did I call you? Then you say, oh, you call me three times. Then they begin the conversation. That is to lay emphasis on what they want to tell you that it's very important. So each time this mother wants to engage the king in the conversation, calls his name three times, my son, my son, to give a bad, and you see the things she was telling the child. She was passing down values, you know, and we're going to talk about values later today, so I'm not going to talk so much about that. So it was calling those conversations. So these children, they will have their own challenging moments. They will have their own trying moments. But by the time you've engaged them in meaningful conversations, when those moments come, they will recall your words. It will be like somebody is playing a, a CD, you know, in their hearing, and they will be guided, you know, by your words, and they will not miss the way. So today we're going to look at these 10 conversations. We're going to look at our faith. We're going to look at identity and purpose. We're going to discuss family values. We're going to discuss service. We're going to discuss love, sex, and sexuality. We discuss finances, lifestyle management, and wellness. Then we discuss service and gratitude. So the first one is faith. Faith is contagious. 
And you should know that we have to start early. You know, early as in, as early as early can be. The MC told us that children, even their wounds, they can listen, they can hear. And that has been scientifically proven that they can respond to sounds. So if you do some praise worship, even while the child is in the womb, the child can make some movement to your praise worship. You want to get the children involved. So it's not enough for daddy and mommy to be in the room, you know, praying, enjoying themselves in praise worship, and they leave the children, you know, out of it. So the children want to see how you respond to your challenging moments, how you bring God into your challenging moments. So, and children can see through us parents very easily. When you are being hypocritical, they know, you know. And um, I was discussing at a forum some time ago, and we were discussing why children of men of God, you know, why some of them don't turn out right. And one of the reasons we could reduce is that, yes, these children, they know the parents, both on the pulpit and at home. And sometimes they find that there's no correlation between the daddy of the pulpit and the daddy at home. So you have to be consistent with your faith. So you don't have to say somebody's at the door or I now send your son. Oh, go and tell him I'm not at home. Then tomorrow you say, okay, let us pray. And the child is confused. What's this man talking about? So we have to be show good examples, faith-wise. So we have to also to buy them age-appropriate Bibles, you know, and Christian literature. So because from this Christian literature, from this Bible, conversations we start. We ask questions and we have, you know, teachable moments with them to explain to them the word of God. You have to pray with them. You have to pray together. Then you have to share testimonies with them. When you have challenges, age appropriate challenges, you know, I mean, you want them to, I mean, sorry, when you have challenges and you can break those challenges to them, I mean, in a way that they will understand. You don't have to make it so complex. Oh, we need some more money. That's just fine. And when God gives the money, you want to share the testimonies, you want to tell them, you remember we prayed about this some days ago? See what God has done. So gradually you are building their faith. You know? Then we should make sure that we lead our children to Christ. We should assume you know, that because we are Christians, our children will just be believers you know, automatically. Uh, one of us in School of Parenting had that experience. Uh, sometimes back, it, it just had this conversation, and that's why it's good to have conversation with our children. He said, are you born again? And the child says, what's born again? You know, I'm not born again. <laughs> so it does said it was scandalous because it was a worker in church. It was house fellowship, leader. It was all, everything you can talk about, you know, in Christian leadership. So it was quite short, but that day he led, you know, his um, teenage child to Christ. So we shouldn't take that assumption. Then the lesson of Abraham and Isaac, for me, it's a big lesson. You know, we know that Isaac got Abraham when he was very old. Close to 100 years old. That was when he had, that was when Abraham had Isaac. And by the time God told Abraham to go and sacrifice his son, his only son, Isaac must be a teenager or a young adult at that time. So they went on that journey, and midway into the journey, Isaac asked his father, he said, This is the firewood. <laughs> you know, this is the fire. But where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Isaac must know, because of his relationship with Abraham, that lamb would be used for the sacrifice. You know? And the response the father gave him is that the Lord will supply. You know? And it didn't make any issue out of it anymore. 
it got to the state to the point that when Isaac was ready for the sacrifice, he laid him on the altar. Can you guess what was going on in the mind of Isaac? Because he was about to be slaughtered. And if nothing happens, he will be slaughtered. But he has worked with his father, you know, so much, he has imbibed the faith of his father. So many times when we listen, I mean, say that story, we talk about the faith of Abraham, but we don't talk about the faith of Isaac. He knew that something will happen, something will give way. So he was ready. He could have pushed his father away. He must have more strength than his father at that point in time. But his father has been able to transfer his faith to him, you know, during these conversations. And God showed up. And you can imagine for the rest of Isaac's life, if anybody should show up and say there's no God, he will say, get away. I have experienced it and I know there's God. So we should also, you know, transfer our faith, you know, into our children. So it should not just be the God of my daddy or the God of my mom. When God is talking, he will say, I'm the God of Abraham, I'm the God of Isaac, I'm the God of Jacob. So it should not just end with us. Our children must own this God. They must take ownership of the faith. You know, and until we do that, then our job is not done as Christian parents. So I call Dr. Runke to take the second point. All right. Thank you very much. So thank you, Dean, and thank you, Brotinde, for your kind words earlier. So we'll move on to point number two and talk about identity and purpose. It's uh, impossible to talk about identity, to have conversations on identity and purpose without referring to faith. So faith must be the foundation of our children's identity, and that must be the line in which we uh, discuss with them. Okay, so recently I asked some children to um, write an essay, a short essay, on the topic, who are you? And one of the feedback I got from the essay um, the child said, I am so, 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 and so, the child of so, 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 and so. And there was one that got my attention. And um, it read some of the things uh, that essay had to say was, I am me. I am created in God's image. I am a blessing to my world. I am um, a work in progress. My best years are ahead of me. And, you know, it went on and on. But you can see from these two excerpts that what the writers wrote was actually, you know, from their sense of identity, what they have been hearing, what their parents have been telling them, what they have been um, um, exposed to in terms of prayers, in terms of the Bible, in terms of the books they have been reading, in terms of the activities they have been engaged in. So it is very important that we have conversations with our children in such a way that they have a great sense of identity of who they are of course in the background of um the bible now when our children uh when they first learned about temperament they found it very interesting to relate each temperament with um, an animal for example they related the, the choleric to uh, a powerful lion the sanguine to the popular otter the phlegmatic to the peaceful golden retriever and the melancholic to the perfect diva. All these analyses were based on uh, a description by Gary Smalley. But you know, it helped them to know who they were, what kind of um, character traits they had, uh, why they were quiet, why some of them were quiet, why some of them were lively, why some of them tended to be moody and all of that. So you see, all of this um, has to do with the identity. And um, so identity, identity um, also has to do with what can you do? Next slide, please. What can you do and what can you not do? What are you allowed to do as children of God? What are you not allowed to do? For our own children, we talk to them early, you know, that um, they should listen to music, but they should descend. They should be descending and not just, um, they should pay attention to the words you know, and not just get carried away and sing whatever manner of songs they wanted to sing without paying attention to the words, because words matter. You know, that them from identity. And um, I remember the youngest of them, one day she was singing and her older one said, 
what are you singing to? What kind of song is that? And she responded by telling them, hey, I'm not listening to the words. It's not about the words. It's just the beat. <laughs> you know, I couldn't even say much because her sense of identity was such that she recognized the words were not for her, but she still wanted to go with the beat. So we are still talking about the sense of identity. Now, sense of identity has to do with internal qualities as well, like the qualities, um, like values, uh, which we will talk about in a bit, like the gifts and talents of each individual. And I will tie this up to saying that let every child know that they are special, they are unique, and they are crafted you know, for their purpose. So again, it is difficult to talk about identity without relating it you know, to purpose. Again, when our children were younger, just to reinforce uh, this conversation of how special a child was, we will tell them, you are special in this manner. You know, you are especially gifted in this manner. You are especially gifted in this other manner so that they would not compare themselves and they would just understand their uniqueness, you know, uh, related to their purpose, you know, and all of that. And we used to sing this song. So um, I know some of you can relate, you know, for you are special, special. Those of you who watch uh, Bunny <laughs> with your children, you're able to relate to that song. You know, so we sang that song again and again, just to let them know that indeed um, they are special. So, um, children raised to compromise what's right get shaped by the world. I like this quote, but another way of interpreting this quote is to say that we need to get to our children before the world gets to them. Dean likes to say that, you know, and I caught that from him. So, we need to get to our children before the world gets to them. And how can we get to our children? We have to make great use of conversation to get our children's attention, to get them to understand who they are, you know. So we, we, we have to make great use of conversation. When we look at um, the story of Moses and the Bible, and we look at the story of Samson, it is obvious that their parents had a fair idea, you know, of who they were. So we are moving up and moving in into purpose right now. Because, you know, I said earlier, it's, it's we, we will tie identity and purpose together. So we are moving on to purpose. And every child on earth, every single child has a purpose. It is left to, we as parents, to help the child to discover their purpose. Of course, the child also has a responsibility. But when they are children, we have more of a responsibility, you know, of watching them, of studying them, of getting to know who they are and letting them see who they are, and this we can achieve by conversation. So, the parents of Moses and um, Samson had a fair idea of who they were. When we read the Bible, we see that um, Moses' mother refused to kill him, refused to, you know, terminate his life because she looked at the child and she said she knew that he was a goodly child. That's what the Bible tells us. Well, that goodly can mean many things. She must have sensed that he was unique, special, with a special assignment of leadership. I believe she had a sense of that because you see that she was involved in the child's upbringing and she had conversations with the child in such a way that the child knew his background. So he wasn't, um, he didn't forget his background. He didn't lose himself in the goodness and the luxury of the palace because his mother and his sister who were hired to tend to him in his growing years, you know, um, he made conversation with him in such a way that he knew who he was. Now, to the story of Samson. Samson's parents also had a good idea that he was uh, born to be a leader. And probably they also thought, oh, this, this could be one of the, you know, one of the people that God will use to deliver us. And so they told him where his strength lay. So that's to, to tell us that we as parents have a duty to help the child to develop um, and, and identify what their purpose is. Um, let me touch a little bit on talents, skills, what children like to do or what they don't like to do. Um, 
the Bible makes us understand that, you know, it is God that works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. So you see, those talents, those things that children like to do, God is working in them to will and to do. And for each child, it is different. So again, parents need to be sensitive. We need to be sensitive to what the, the child's um, abilities are. Um, you know, some parents make their children go to school to study courses that have nothing to do with their own makeup. And when the children go through those, um, the, the study, sometimes four or five years, six years, and sometimes even more, they come out at the end of the day and they say, Mommy, Daddy, take your certificate. This is for you. Which means they are, they are saying to the parent, um, you haven't studied me. You don't know what makes me, me. You don't really know what makes me tick. So this one that I did, I did, you know, for you. And I want to relate it with this um, um, quote that says, when purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. If we don't know the purpose of the children or have a fair sense of their purpose, then we're likely to abuse them because we will not have conversations with them that will help them, you know, in um, establishing, achieving their purpose. It's like asking a fish to climb the tree. You know, that's putting a wrong peg in, in a kind of wrong hole. So if we don't know and pay attention, the to the purpose of our children, we are likely to, <laughs> to abuse them. So, Dean, I think yours is the, I'll hand over to you for the next point. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to talk on the third conversation, which is family values. The values are fundamental principles and beliefs that guide and determine all members of a family function and interact with the larger society. Talking about family values now. So they are fundamental principles. That is, they are the bedrock. They are the foundation of how the family and interacts with the larger society. Every family must craft its own family value. There are so many values. I mean, you might not be able to exhaust all of them, but you have to pick the key ones that are germane to your family. Long ago, we did, uh, we crafted our own family value, which has been very helpful for us. I mean, this we must have done this over 20 years ago. And we came up with the acronym, Last J. So if you ask any member of the family that was Last J, they could tell you that that's an that's like acronym for a family value. And the L is for love. So I'm giving you expo. A is for accountability. The S is for service. You know, H for humility. And J for justice. So each time you want to take an action, you want to run that action by our values. You know, is it going to show love? Are we going to be accountable in this situation? Service humility and justice. I remember some time ago, I had, you know, I was offered a political appointment and I was interacting with this uh, government official who offered it to me. And I told him, I have to go and run it by my family. The man was shocked. He said, what did you say? I said, I have to go and run it by my family. And I gave back to you. You know, so it was very, it thought I would jump at it like that. So I discussed it with my wife and I discussed with the children. You know, and the children said something which is very germane. They said, if we put you know, this opportunity by our family values, you know, will it, you know, will it scale you know, the test? And I saw that, yeah. That appointment, you know, might be messy. It's a political appointment. And they might, my first son actually said, Daddy, you protected your integrity all this far. We know you for this. If you go into this, you know, you might have that integrity compromised or stained. And I will tell you so many years down the line, you know, this same um, person, it's a person of integrity, no doubt, but he was messed up. 
from that position, you know, and it will have been messed up and it will have been messed up along with him. You know? So value sometimes you know, acts as a check, you know, to some of your actions. And they can be passed from generation to generation. You know, they include the social, the moral, the religious, the economic and political principles that family holds as important and believe. So it could be social, it could be moral, it could be religious, it could be economic, it could be political principles, you know. So they vary. And um, like I said earlier, they could be passed from one generation to another generation. And the example I want to give here is the example of Jonathan Edwards and Max Jukes. These are two human beings who lived in the same city, New York City, about the same time. But they came out with different destinies. Okay, let me, let me go to that slide to show that, then I come back. Okay, so Jonathan Edwards was a pre-time preacher in the 1700s. He was one of the respected teachers of his time. He attended you know, the Yale University. So he had 11 children. But one thing that was peculiar to Jonathan Edwards, no matter where he goes to, he makes sure he comes home, you know, if he's not traveled outside the city, comes home every day and spend at least one hour with his children. Constructive engagement. He will spend one hour with them and he will pray, you know, for each of these children. 11 of them, you can imagine. He will pray for them, he will bless them, you know. And he was doing this, you know, in conjunction with his wife. So, 150 years after his death, a research was done into his family, you know, and I was going to tell you what the research showed in his family. They found that in Jonathan Edwards family, that family in 150 years produced one US vice president, produced one dean of a law school, produced one dean of a medical school, produced three US senators, three governors in the United States of America, three mayors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 65 professors, 75 military officers, 80 public office holders, 100 lawyers, you know, that family over 150 year time, then 285 college graduates. And I said, I mean, is that not impressive to start with? So they studied, you know, 150 years down his lineage, and they thought that he has produced this. Now, let's contrast this with Max Jukes. So there was this social experiment in prison. So they were trying to trace the origin of prisoners. They are trying to see what went wrong. What were the foundational issues, you know, that led to these prisoners being in prison? Then they stumbled that 42 of the prisoners, you know, have the same lineage. You know, they are from the same lineage. And they discovered that they are from one person, all originated from one person by name, Mark Jukes. So out of 1,200 descendants of Mark Jukes that were studied, they found that seven of them were murderers. They had among them, 60 of them were thieves. 190 of them were prostitutes. 150 of them have been convicted for one thing or the other. 300 of them were paupers, you know. 440 of them, you know, were addicted to alcohol, you know. And 300 of them died prematurely. You know? So see how a man, one person built his life on values. And those values transcended down his generation. And see how another person, you know, built his life carelessly, you know, and messed up, you know, generations after him. 
So that is how important values can be. So it is not only for us, you know, it is for those coming after us. And God is interested in those that will succeed us. If he says, I'm the God of Abraham, I'm the God of Isaac, I'm the God of Jacob. So he's saying, I'm the God of several generations. Let's just look at examples of family values. Like I said, your family values could be spiritual and religious values. They could be social values. They could be civic values. They could be work values. They could be home values. They could be character. So you can have a mix of all these, you know, depending on how you want to organize your family. And I want to advise that when you are crafting family value, don't just craft it alone. If your children, you know, are old enough, you know, to be part of their conversation, bring them in, you know, and have an age appropriate meeting where you can all agree at what your family value should be. We agreed, we, we, out of several ones, we knocked out several ones, you know, to achieve, I mean, to arrive at our own family values, you know, which are just five of them, the core values. So spiritual and religious values could be like things like love for God, love for the people, Sabbath observance, believe in the Bible, active church participation, personal Bible study, religious family worship, tithing, environmental stewardship, financial stewardship, bodily stewardship. For character values, you can have things like integrity, honesty, gift, positivity, courage, kindness. For social values, you can have things like acceptance, respect, politeness, appropriate language, service to others. For civic values, you can have things like understanding rights, stand up for the rights of others, freedom for all. Then for work values, you can have punctuality, education and training, doing one's best, cooperation. And for own values, you can have things like sharing meals, quality time, love for one another, and things like that. So on family values, I'm going to end our discussion with the story that I love to share, you know. It's a story of Ivan Fernandez and Abel Motai. The two of them were involved in a race sometimes in January 2013. It was the Bulada cross country race. By the way, Bulada is in Spain. Abel Montai uh, was a one time bronze medalist at uh, the London Olympics. So he was favored to win the race. It was a long distance race, a cross country race. And he started very well. And coming at a fast second to him was Ivan Fernandez. And Abel got to a point that is slowed down. We have to understand that Abel could not read uh, the, because the instructions were written you know, in Spanish. So he could not read the instructions. So he thought he had gotten to the finish line. So he slowed down. But Ivan Fernandez coming at a distant second, see, saw him slow down. So it was just, you know, just trying to him. You know, moving to him, continue to run, you're not there yet. Continue to run, you're not there yet. You know, actually, Ivan Fernandez literally pushed, you know, Abel Montai to win the race. You see, he could have moved ahead of him by the time he slowed down, he caught up with him, he could have just gone ahead of him and won the race. And that was what everybody expected because it would have been on record that he ran past an Olympian. But he slowed down, he pushed him to win the race. So when the race was over, journalists swam around him and they asked him, oh, why did you do that? You lost a one in a hundred opportunity you know, to win this cross country race. And he told them, he said, this guy was clearly the leader. I mean, by no means he ran the fastest race. But this is a part of the quote that tripped me you know, most. He said, but what will be the merit of my victory? What will be the honor of that medal? What would my mom think of it? You know, 
Yes, I will have the victory, but what will be the honor of that medal? So that means honor is part of their family value. And he brought his mom into it. What will my mom think of it? Oh, that means we've not respected our family values. Oh, that means we've compromised those family values. So those are the guiding principles. We, Bulada country race is not remembered for who won that race. It's not remembered for the quality of that race, but will forever be remembered you know, by the action of Ivan Fernandez. You know? And if you talk about that race today, Ivan Fernandez will come up. And that has etched his name in gold, not because he participated in the race, but because he built you know, values into what he was doing. So we have to build our home culture. Everyone should build his or home culture and you should build it on the foundation of values. Sister Ruka, can you go on to the next slide? Thank you, Dean. Lovely story that you gave us there. Okay, um, so we're going to talk about service and for the next, uh, well, you know we're still going to number 10. So we have a lot to share with you, but we will try as much as possible to share quickly so that we can release you <laughs> when we say we'll release you. So let's have a few words on service. And let's um, start by trying to define what service is. Service is doing something to help someone or working um, for someone. And if we are, I'm sure that a lot of us study our Bible well. So we know that Jesus' life, for example, was built around service. And that was what he tried to teach his disciples. He said to them, anybody who's going to be the greatest of you must be the servant of all. So service, service, and service. I like the way Pastor Samadhi um, says it. He says, your life is too small, you know, for mm -hmm. it to be the purpose of your life. In other words, um, our lives are more than being about ourselves. Our lives must be about um, service. Proverbs tells us that you see a man who is diligent, he will stand before kings, he will not stand before men. In other words, you see a man who gives service continually, that kind of man is going to great places because he cannot stand before kings without being a great man, you know, himself. So we must teach our children the value of service. We must have conversations about service. And, you know, where to start is by helping them to do service at home. They must start at home before they go outside. So we need to have these conversations with them first. We need to encourage them so that they don't have a, an entitlement mentality, a mentality that I, I, I should get it. No, nothing belongs to you. If you are giving anything, is gift, is grace, or is something you have worked for. So these are some of the conversations that we need to have with our children. And we need to help them, you know, by starting at home, help them to participate in volunteering, um, activities. Volunteering means they do it, they serve, and they don't get paid for it, you know. At the most, they probably get a thank you, but that's a good place to start. Let them start with doing domestic chores at home, because when they do domestic chores, it's not about them as a job, but it's about looking after everybody. It's about creating a clean environment for every member of the family. So that's where to start. On this note, I will just wrap up by saying that service, you know, we must have conversations with them that lets them know that service is indeed a pathway to destiny. So those are the few thoughts on um, service that we will share. And I will let Dean take the next one on love. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, love, for a child, love is spelled T-I-M-E. So for a child, quality time, you know, matters a lot, matters than even gifts that you might lavish on them. Well, I, mentioned, I talked about um, Jonathan Edwards a while ago, and Jonathan Edwards spent one hour quality time per day with the children, and we saw the results. It's not just the time you are home reading newspapers or watching football, it's that time of engagement then we must also learn to use phrases like, I love you, you know. Some children, or by the time they become adults, 
the first time they will hear those words, I love you, they'll be from some just, you know, random guys who will use the word, I love you, and they respect, you know, <laughs> all their feet, and they will fall into wrong hands. But if consistently they've had the word, I love you, I love you, I love you, if the guy should mention, should tell them I love you, they say, it's nothing new. You know, I've had that from my dad over and over and over again. You know? So we should not just say those words. You know, we should mean those words. We should, you know, put those words into action. The child knows that, should know beyond words that you love them. You know, the, the, and this will be seen in your conversation and in your action. And I quickly want to say that the best thing, you know, a father can do for the child is to love the mom. And the best thing a mom can do for the child is to love the father. Because the children are looking at you and they are molded after you. When you don't show love to one another, when you throw your house, you know, to boxing ring, they are watching. In fact, the environment is tensed around the house. The children are not developing emotionally as they should develop. They are not developing psychologically as they should develop. So, so much tension. It will affect them, you know, in their behavior outside. It will affect their morals. It will affect their emotions themselves. So we should try as much as possible to demonstrate love, you know, all around love in the family. And we should also encourage the children to show love to one another. There's so much abuse right now. You know, even in the Christendom, abuse between couples. And this abuse, you know, some of them are foundational. They didn't just happen today. You know, there are things that the children have watched, you know, uh, originate in their own families. Relationship between, toxic relationship between fathers and mothers. They've seen all those things played out. You know, it's only a matter of time before these things too will show up in the lives of the children. So it is like garbage in, garbage out. So we should be deliberate to create that environment of love, you know, within the house, no fighting. And um, I, I, I remember, I know we are pressed for time now, but I remember this occasion, uh, I was in court one day, and the case before mine happened to be uh, a case between two brothers who brought themselves to court. And one of them was a professor. I think it was in the medical industry. The other was an architect. And they, they, they were fighting over inheritance. The two of them are comfortable from, from the look of things. They, they are, the two of them stand, you know, well off. But... They wanted to prove one point to the other. You know. So they were engaged in this bitter quarrel you know, over their father's assets. And the assets were wasting away. And I remember what the judge said. He said, the two of you grew up in the same house. They said, yes. He said, one father, one mother. They said, yes. He said, do you still remember that house? Do you still, do you still have assets to that house? He said, yes, we still have assets to the house. He said, I'm going to adjourn this case. I want you to go back to that house. I want you to imagine and visualize the time you were toddlers running about this house, you know, pulling yourself together, shouting together, you know. Try to remember the love you had for each other then, you know. If it will spark something in you, you know, for you to settle this quarrel, I will be happy. If it won't, come back on the next adjournment and come and give me the report. I mean, that was very instructive for me. But then I asked myself, if it had all been quarrel, even from the time they were toddlers or they were, then they wouldn't have anything to fall back, you know, uh, fall back on. So these are the type of reality that we find right now. But we should now try to, every parent should try to make sure that, you know, we avoid sibling rivalry for our children later in life by helping them to respect each other, helping them to have genuine love for each other. Then parents loving children, children loving parents, then children to children love should be promoted. Also encourage for parents who have a meet time with the children 
have a shepherd time with, if you have more than one, have a shepherd time with each and every one of them. Express your love to each and every one of them the best way you can. You know? Yes, we should be firm with discipline, but we should be empathetic with these children. We should discipline with love. You know, don't discipline out of annoyance. You know, let the children appreciate the input of your discipline. I remember when the children were growing up, you know, those earlier, those uh, pre teenage years, when there are reasons for them to be disciplined, some of them will come back and say, Oh, daddy, oh, thank you for yesterday, you know, and I'm comforted because they understand. Now I know that by saying that, they understood the import of the discipline. Some, you just discipline a child, you punish a child, then the child is not better off. Then you've lost on that discipline. So discipline with love. And um, let's be there for our children at their vulnerable moments. As they grow up, they will be exposed to so many things. I mean, realities of life. And you want to be the first point of call the children will, I mean, you make. You know, if they have a challenge uh, as young adults, before they call their friends, you want them to reach out to you. Oh, daddy, oh, what's your opinion on this? What do you think about this? What should I do in this situation? You know? So, and you should be there for them. You should support them all the way. So you also have to teach them to show love to others. Let your children respect others. Let them respect elders, their contemporaries, and their subordinates. Thank you for that. So, Sister Rika, you want to go on this one? Yes, I'll talk about uh, sexuality and sex. That's number six. So sexuality is about a lot of things. It's about um, thoughts, it's about feelings, it's about attraction, and it's about behavior. Um, so we will discuss sexuality, you know, in the context of the Bible. Uh, Mark 10, 6 tells us that he created them male and female. And, you know, when we go to the um, Genesis, we see that God created the man and then he created the woman. So we will talk about sexuality in that context. And in that context, we co have conversations with our children, you know, to help them develop their sense of, it's part of their sense of identity too. I'm a girl or I'm a boy or, you know, girls walk in a particular way. They must be careful with the way they walk, with the way they sit, with the way they carry themselves. And boys need to um, learn also to be gentlemen. So it is our duty as parents to have conversations with our girls as we groom them to be ladies and uh, to have conversations with our boys as we groom them to be gentle men. I remember one of the conversations my dad had with me was my gait, the way I walked, and he demonstrated to me. I wish I could demonstrate it to you now, but then <laughs> it will have to be another time. You know, he demonstrated to me that I used to walk, pushing my tummy out. I think I must have been age 10, 11 at that time. And then he said, no, that's not how a lady works. And then, you know, for a man, you know, he proceeded to show me <laughs> how a lady should walk. And I haven't forgotten it. So, you see, that sense of identity, that sense of sexuality, we should have conversations with them to guide this uh, sense of um, sexuality. Um, do I have my side? Yes, thank you. So, we need to start having conversations about body parts very early, um, right from the side before the sleep right from, you know, when the child is old enough to understand words, understand body parts. And we think that should be around the age of 18 months when we discuss public parts, when we discuss private parts, you know, when we discuss um, what kind of touch is appropriate, what kind of touch is not appropriate. When we mention the names of body parts, I don't use those names or pseudonyms or any other thing like that. So call breast, breast, call penis, penis call pubic hair, pubic hair, call axillary hair, axillary hair, and so on and so forth. Make it so comfortable that they understand, you know, um, this body part and they can have conversations really about them. Talk about puberty. Talk about changes that will occur in puberty before they occur. You know, talk about breast development in girls. Talk about development of body odor. Talk about how they can manage um, body odor. Talk about menstruation. Talk about... Um, uh, what age menstruation can prepare them early so that you know when they do have these changes, they are used to that they can run to you, you know, for help and then you can help them, um, you know, to, to manage their sex and then their sexuality. Uh, discuss, have conversations about sex is very important. 
start it when the child, when you know the child can understand what sex means. When we talk about sex education, we will, we will talk about it in age appropriate terms. So talk about it early. Uh, don't give the child more than the child needs to know at time, but don't run away from this portion. Use very simple language to help them to know what sex is until the age when you can use more sophisticated uh, language. Help them to understand that sex should be had, you know, in the right context of using, of having sex must be within the context of marriage when they are licensed adults. Give them analogies of driving and of sex. Driving is not a bad thing in itself, but if it's done, you know, before the adult age, in, which in most countries is 18, and in some countries 16, then it is wrong. The same thing for sex in, in God's eyes. So have conversations uh, such that they understand what sex is. I cannot help but recommend this book, uh, what my children need to know before they leave home. It deals extensively with the subject of sex. So read it as a parent, so you understand how you can generate conversations with children. And then when the children are old enough, let them read it for themselves. And then you have those conversations together and you will be amazed you know, at the kind of things that will come out from you ha having such uh, discussions with them. So we cannot uh, not include, talk about money, okay? So we will, we will talk about conversations about money and conversations about finances. So Dean, over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Well, we can't exhaust the, everything we have on these topics, so we are just going to highlight them. And um, we have some CDs on some of these topics, which you can avail yourself. If you, if you contact any of the officials, we can try to get you CDs that are relevant to all these values. We have them, we've done them as single topics at one time or the other. So we have CDs on money management for kids. We have um, CDs on kidpreneur, you know, how to turn your children to entrepreneur. So I'm going to talk about finance. So we need to teach our children money skills, you know, financial awareness and wealth. Nowadays, our children, you know, or children generally, they know next to nothing about money. They just feel, and in fact, some churches preach it. I, I don't want to go into controversy, I mean, today or this morning, but the way they preach that you get this money, it's just as if the thing will just fly into your bank account. You just live today and you find the money tomorrow. So we need to begin to change the narrative for our children, you know, to know that, you know, money is a medium of exchange. So in their childhood years, it's good for us to make our children recognize money and the fundamentals of money, that it is just a medium of exchange. And when they get to the preteen years, we should start by giving them, you know, small allowances and guide how they spend the money. You know, give them a little bit of leeway, take them to the supermarket and see, you know, what their priorities are, what will they pick, you know, from the things they pick, then you know where their values like, where it lies. So we should teach them how to budget. You know, we should introduce our children to the world of banking. You want to open a bank account for your children, you know, and, and there are so many of so many accounts that you can open. I know there are some you can open when they are 16 or thereabouts, some before they are 16. So just get to the bank and look for an account that is appropriate for your children and teach them saving and let them know how much they have at time. Some children will be so interested that they want to continue to build on, you know, those savings. So from there, they buy the very good habit of saving. When they get to their teenage years, we want to teach them about proper money management. Because at about this time, they'll be going to university and they will be spending the money for themselves. You know. uh, okay, let me... Let me digress here a little bit. My first is a, is a boy. And when he was going to university, 
he was collecting some handsome amount of money, <laughs> you know? And uh, the second, another guy, so he was collecting the same amount. And they will still complain. So I have to tell them, you guys, you have to manage, you know, what, you know, I give you, or what we give you, the mom and I. But the third, a girl, when she went to university, I found that she never complained one day about, you know, not having enough money. And there was a time I had, it, I had to pay for something. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm broke. She said, daddy, I'm a genie. I said, oh, I can give you this amount of money. So she actually gave me money, and I was surprised. So I went to the first I said, you guys have cheated me. Ah! I said, if Titi was the first, I said, I would have been properly guided. You know, we're giving you this money. You know? So what am I saying in that sense is, you know, yeah, this money mind men, you know, children have um, different approaches to it. But overall, you know, we have to guide them and we have to teach them. You know, but now every of them knows the, the importance of saving because we demonstrate it, we talk about it, we have to talk about it. You know, we've seen, I mean, we're adults, and we've seen some of our colleagues who have earned good money in life. Not only our colleagues, we've seen some sportsmen who have earned good money in life. And today, their purpose, all the money is filtered away. They spent it on frivolities. So you don't want that to happen to your child. So you want to teach them good money management. You want to teach them how to earn income, teach them avenues for multiplying wealth. You know, I also advise that you know they read books like Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Every of the children read that book. They made them to read that book so that they can have idea of investment. So, like I tell people, you have to practice what you preach. You can't say manage your funds, save money, and they see you spending on frivolities yourself. You know, it is one, I should be today, another tomorrow, this tomorrow, and this tomorrow. And sometimes, some of those I should be, you know, you borrow money to buy them. You are not buying them from your surplus. You know? So you are sending wrong, you know, messages, wrong conversations, you know, with those children. You know, take control of the narrative for your children when it comes to finances, for everything. The social media is painting its own narrative to us. We have the ubiquitous banners of this world. And you see the way they spend that money, you know. You see children, they, want, they just want to be like hush puppy. You know, nobody asks where the money is coming from, but they just want to spend that money. So we have to tell them that, look, yes, money is earned, and money is spent in a responsible and reasonable manner, you know. A lot of young people in university, they're into Yahoo Yahoo. And now, <laughs> there's a new trend that is coming up now. Families are being arrested for Yahoo, Yahoo Yahoo. Families involving the children, involving the father, involved. so it's now becoming a family business, you know? So we must change the narrative for our children. And it's better to begin when they are very young so that we have that correct, you know, perspective about money. So okay, go to number eight, please. Let's talk about lifestyle and wellness. Uh, my dad used to say that being sick is expensive, and for anybody who has been sick, you know, it's not when it's not until you lose health that you appreciate what it means to be healthy. So I agree with them, the treatment, and I say that it's better to do all we can to stay healthy so that we will not have to pay expensive medical bills for being ill. And this must be the vein in which we discuss. Um, with our children. So we should have discussions of, on, on, on basic hygiene. We should have discussions on cleanliness. We should have discussions on orderliness, you know, um, in the home. And we should pay attention to meals. Um, yes, we need to have conversations with them about what balanced meals are, what healthy meals are, and all that. But since right now they are dependent on us, we need to show them what healthy meals are. You know, so uh, we need to cut out the sugar, cut out the sugar in, in fizzy drinks, cut out the amount of sugar they take to school in terms of pastry, in terms of fried food, in terms of uh, sweetened drinks. Let them drink more water. 
And um, even as we say, let them do this, have conversations with them about that. As Dean said earlier, you know that when we do have these conversations, it means, it means that we too, we are working the work. We're not just talking, but we are showing them by example the way to go. So let's talk with them about um, hygiene, body odor, how to take care of body odor, regular bath, uh, deodorant. Let's provide them with deodorant and let's show them um, how to use this deodorant. Let's discuss mouth odor with them. Let's talk about um, uh, dental care, you know, uh, brushing their teeth twice daily and then brushing their tongue also, especially in the morning, um, so that the risk of uh, bad breath is reduced. And from time to time, um, okay, another cause of bad breath in this vein is not drinking enough water. So let's um, discuss with them about drinking enough water and let us also make a habit of drinking enough water. And when you notice when you talk to them, you know that they have bad breath. Because they've had these conversations in the house about bad breath, you can just look at them, whisper to them and say, oh, time to go drink water. And you know, the child gets the message and knows what that means. So when they have that kind of consciousness of the conversations that we have even at home, when they go outside of the home, they are able to comfort themselves. And you know, God wants us to be healthy. You know, he wants us to be healthy, our spirits, our souls, and our bodies. Um, exercises, next slide. Um, daily exercises too are important. So we should encourage them to have daily exercises. And this means that we, we should also lead the way by having exercises on a, a regular basis. And that is, um, you know, that should be daily. And when we do that and let them do, then we'll be able to monitor their screen time and adjust the screen time, you know, cut the screen time because there are side effects that are associated with uh, prolonged um, screen time. They don't sleep well. And then the younger children have poor development when they have um, prolonged screen time. They are, their, their social um, development is not as strong as it should be because they spend a lot of time on the screen. So we should monitor the time they spend with the devices. And we should have discussions with those who are old enough to understand um, that um, using devices is good, but using devices in excess is not good. Maybe I should quickly chip in here that you know the American Pediatric um, Association actually recommends for children to use screen time only one to two hours a day. So if you remember that, we'll be guided by the amount of screen time that we let the children use and let them, you know, also have an input into how much screen time, you know, being guided by these rules they will have um, per week. Yes, let's um, encourage them to make healthy choices. Let them know in discussions that our bodies are the temple of God. And so we need to keep this temple healthy. We need to keep this um, temple clean. Um, so, so that we maintain that cleanliness and that temple. And we can live a long life in the service of God. Dean, you want to talk to us about security? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sister, okay. Now, safety and security. And I guess this is my bus stop, right? <laughs> For this session. Well, we need to talk uh, about safety and security to our children. It's very important. Their lives can depend on it. You know, you have to anticipate things happening. You have to create scenarios for things happening. Your children should you know, be aware of the environment at all times. You know, it could come in handy, you know, for them. So around the house, you know, you want to teach them things like how they keep dangerous objects, razor blades, needles. If anyone should pick any, for example, we use um, a needle, probably you use it on your dress or something. When you are done, you have to teach your children where to put the needle. You have to put the safety pin. You should know. You have to put the razor blade. Don't just keep it carelessly for another to step on it. Even you yourself, the, the child that kept it there, might step on it, then it leads to injury. And some of this injury can be fatal. So you want to take, teach them where you know, to keep 
all these dangerous objects, knives and all the stuff. So this, you have to know that. So that those are conversations we must have with them. You want to take them to remove obstructions from the way. You know, and you have to do it yourself. You know, uh, women put on high heels, just like my wife. And sometimes when she comes back, I mean, she's, she's a lot better now. You know, she just, <laughs> she puts up those high heels and she put them probably in the city room, the dining room. I mean, she, then she calls for her slippers. But she won't take those heels away from there. And, and I say, look, I tell her, if it's in the night and, I mean, the power goes off and someone innocently steps on those heels, that person can have the handcuff broken. You know, so you want to remove all those things. So you want to take the children, oh, when you see heels here, take them here and go and keep them where they should be. See, you don't know how useful this training will be until something goes wrong. You know, domestic accident is as real, you know, as vehicle accident. So you should avoid both. You know? So you want to teach them about gas safety, you know, how to turn off the gas, you know, locking doors. Uh, you want to give them, if by the time they are teenagers, you want to give them that responsibility. Oh, in the night, be the one to check the doors, you know, whether it's a male or female. You know, just make sure the gate is locked, make sure the back door is locked and everything. You are helping them for the future because by the time they are grown, you know, and when they are by themselves, you know, they will be aware and conscious, you know, of locking doors, locking their vehicles and all the stuff. Then want to, let's talk about car and drive away safety. Just today, while cycling, I, and I see that around my estate all the time. You see a father or a mother driving behind the wheels and that dad who claims to love that child, he puts the child on the laps and you are driving. You know, if anything happens and you slam, you know, the brake, the child will hit the head on the steering wheels, I mean, on the steering. And trauma could result from that to the child's head. So it's very dangerous. And I mean, parents pride themselves in doing that. But why don't you get a car seat? You know? So the child is learning. And some even have children at the back of the car. They have the young one there. They are watching you and they are learning. You are, whether you like it or not, you are conversing with them. It's not verbal but they are non-verbal communication. You are telling them this is what is right, you know? And they will one day want to do that too. You know? And it can lead to a disastrous end. So we should teach our children to use the car seat at every point in time. When, I mean, if you, if you open the flap of the vehicle, there's, a, there's an age below which a child should not sit in front. I can't remember the age now, you know, but when our children were below that age, they don't sit in front. So they sit at the back, you know. And there's a reason for that. They sit at the back and they use their seat belts. I remember so many years ago, when I was serving in a company, you know, a driver was sent to pick uh, the child of these uh, expatriates. And he was coming back, you know, to the office. And I think it was over speeding. So he got to the roundabout, lucky, then the roundabout was still on the lucky address level. Then I think he just slammed his brake. You know, suddenly, and the child, he, he had his seatbelt on, the car some assaulted about three times. The driver survived the accident because he had the seatbelt on, but the child did not survive. He was flown out of the window, out of the, out of the window, rolled several times, broke his neck, had multiple, you know, um, injury and he died. So it is good when the child gets into the vehicle, he should know that, look, I have to use the seatbelt, you know, whether the dad is there or not. So those are things, conversations you have to, you know, engage your children. Then when they are not um, old enough to drive, please don't give them the steering. I remember I had this conversation <laughs> with my first son so many years ago because a lot of his mates were driving at 16 and he wanted to drive at 16. You know, I told him you can't drive at 16 because you are not, you know, 
another person's child. You are my child. We have values here. And what does our value say? You know, we have to respect the law. So he waited till he was 18, you know, before he learned to drive. So it was very easy with me, with his junior brother. So he had to wait till 18 too, to drive. So don't cut corners. Don't be in too much in a hurry. You know, engage these children, conversation why they cannot drive now. You know, so we have um, fire safety. If you have the fire extinguisher, teach your children to use it. Let them know where you place the fire extinguisher around the house. Uh, then the peer caution. We should be able, you know, to teach our children how to discern, how to pick their friends. You know, every um, every person cannot be your child's friend because their values will differ. You know, so they should learn to pick friends who have similar values as theirs. So their values will not be compromised, you know. Uh, the Bible says evil communication corrupts good manners. So they should know, you know, without your involvement, who their friends should be. So you should have those conversations. You can stimulate situations, you know, and say, oh, if a child does this and this and this and this, you know, will you be comfortable to, comfortable to have that child as your friend? Then they will tell you yes, or they tell you no. If yes, why yes? If no, why no? You know, and that could also be a teachable moment for them to know who to associate with and who not to associate with. So I'm sure you want to listen to the last one, which is on gratitude. And um, I hand over to Dr. Akela. Thank you, Dean. So we gradually wrap up on these 10 conversations that uh, we need to have. And if you haven't put in your questions, please put in your questions now so that uh, we can attempt to answer them as best as possible right after the presentation. So we look at gratitude and let's try to define what gratitude is. So gratitude is an expressed emotion of thankfulness. You know, it is readiness to show appreciation and it is readiness to return um, kindness. And we can be thankful for a lot of things, including people, including items, things that are tangible or some, some things that are not even tangible. We can be thankful for experiences and we can be thankful for situations. For example, we can be thankful that we have shelter, we are not homeless. So that's a situation to be thankful for. And you know, gratitude helps us to see things from a positive point of view. And gratitude dispels negative emotions like depression, like jealousy, you know, because once it chooses to uh, develop that mindset because it is a mindset, you know. One chooses to stay on that mindset of gratitude. Gratitude also limits the ability of the person to complain because when you are grateful, you are less of the person that complains about everything and every situation. Gratitude improves, even strengthens relationships. You know, you are more endeared to the person that you uh, do a favor for and comes back to say thank you. And that's one that you... Um, Put yourself all out for and doesn't even appreciate it. So even in the family setting, um, showing gratitude improves and strength, strengthens relationships. So for all of these reasons, we need to have conversations about gratitude with our children. And this conversation must begin with manners. You know, we often tell our children, mind your P's and Q's. So learn when to say please and not demand. You don't demand, you make requests. You know, let know when to say please and know when to say thank you as a form of appreciation. Also within the home, a show of gratitude begins by appreciating you, you know, the parent. Begins by honoring you, by greeting, you know, in the morning and as often as possible in the course of the day for, for different things. Um, gratitude has to do with showing respect as well. So a child who shows respect at home and honors the parents in the home setting because he has been taught to do so, because he had had conversations around this, he's also likely to value other members of the society and to honor them, you know. So um, at home, we can help these conversations by asking our children questions like, what are you grateful for? Why do you think you received a gift from Mr. X or Mrs. Z or Auntie somebody? And how do you feel, you know, about the gift? So you are helping the child to think 
and then to express. And then you can also ask, is there something you can do to show that you appreciate this gift, you know, that you have been given? So those are some of the questions that we can ask and conversations that will attend around gratitude. Now, next, uh, we, we say that a grateful, there's a quote that says that a grateful heart attracts miracles. And I like this quote, really. This, this one I'm about to quote, I really like it. It says that gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all others. So if we have taught our children to be grateful, if we have had good conversations about gratitude and they have learned to imbibe um, the mindfulness of gratitude, it, it is likely that you know, parents, uh, children like that will also have many um, attributes, many virtues, which <coughs> endear them to other people, open doors of opportunities for them, and then you know, lift them from one level to the next higher level. So, as we conclude, so we conclude, uh, we conclude this talk by, um, you know, concluding from how we started by saying that there are several conversations that we need to have, but we have just highlighted a few of them. But at least if we make this few, the foundation of the conversations we have with the children, we'll find it easier to have many more conversations with them. And it will be, um, you know, we will be able to build that relationship with our children. And that relationship that we have built that is strong, will continue to be stronger even as they enter into adolescence, and then young adults, and then older adults, and then when they make us uh, grandparents, so you see, um, these conversations, we must have them. And we now know that we can have conversations anyway, not just at home, because, but uh, note that there are some conversations that need to be done privately, um, and a lot of conversations can be done openly, irrespective of who is listening. You might even be teaching those people listening to your conversations a thing or two. And if you are one of uh, the people that have not really started paying attention to having conversations with your children and you think your children have grown and it's too late, no, it's not too late. Now you know. Start today and then be a better person. So this very last slide is that of a child, you know, representing all of these children that we have been talking about all day. And this child says to tell you, thank you, dear parents, for all the thoughtful conversations you have had with us and for those that you will have with us in the future. Thank you for listening. But Cindy, over to you. Thank you very much, Duchess, Dr. Runke Akiola, and to our Dean in the School of Parenting. Thank you. Dr. Dayo Adebayo. You're welcome. You know, when you mentioned earlier about that family that was producing uh, deans, when you contrasted the two families where values were passed on from generation to generation, it was, it was gratifying to know that one family produced dean of school of this and dean of school of that. And I said, well, we also have a dean of school of parenting who comes from a, who comes from a long line of, uh, of, of successful parents Thank to you. successful children. Thank you. So, so thank you both. Uh, our you. time is far spent, so we are going to be very quick with the interactive session because this is the next area, and this is where we get to have questions answered. Uh, you may still send in any questions that you have on your mind. So if you have any questions, I'm talking to participants now. If you have any questions, please feel free to send those questions in and we will do our best to answer as many as possible within the time that we have. So straight away, I want to introduce three new panelists who will join for the purpose of this question and answer session. The first person is Sister Chinyere Owanta. Chinyere Owanta is an author, a coach, and speaker on marriage, parenting, and family issues. She is a mother and wife to Emenike. She is a mother, comma, so don't get me wrong. She is a mother, comma, and wife. That she's a mother to five children, even though she didn't state that, but I can I can authoritatively confirm she's a mother to five children. 
and she's wife to Emenike, with whom she runs their ministry for marital and family bliss. And have authored the bestsellers, Marital Bliss, How to Keep the Flame Ablaze, Rudiments of Parenting, A Godly Parenting Companion, and Wisdom for Singles. So you can see that she has a broad spectrum of knowledge on issues relating to family and uh, parenting. She is, of course, a member of the faculty of the School of Parenting of Daystar Christian Center. She will be joined also by Okpayemi Aruwulu. Okpayemi Aruwulu is a seasoned, passionate, and certified professional counselor with over 14 years of experience working with individuals, couples, families, groups, and schools. She deals extensively on the family, parenting, children, relationships, marriage, etc. She's the founder of Inspired Rich World, a counseling outfit that focuses on the renewing of minds and building lives through counseling with deep and rare combination of facts with practical concepts. She's passionate about mentoring young people, especially in the area of sex and sexuality and self-discovery. She gives talks in secondary schools on love, sex, dating, sexual abuse, and trending negative issues on young people. They, they will be joined by, last but not the least, Brother Tony Sawyer. Tony Sawyer trained as an architect, and he's a minister of God's word with passion for leadership and good governance across various strata of the society. He coordinates a platform called Future Leaders Now. So Future Leaders Now for the raising up of new generation of leaders, particularly among the young adults. He is based in Mowe, Ogun State, with his wife, and they are blessed with three boys and two girls. So they also have five children. Uh, Brother Dayo Adebayo has four children. Okoyemi Arolo, three. Duchess, three. And... Uh, I mentioned earlier Chinyere Owanta, five. So um, don't, however, assume that in school of parenting, unless you have three or more children, you are not qualified to be a member of the faculty. Um, it is open to everybody, even people that are not yet married are members of the school of parenting. I will go to Brother Dayo for the next question, and it's, it's on the issue of faith. On the issue of faith, how much should parents get involved in the spiritual journey of their children? Is there a line not to cross? Because some people say that since most of us discovered our spiritual self by ourselves, should we allow our children to also discover their spiritual selves by themselves? Okay, thank you. Well, uh... The Bible says God set the solitary in families. And everyone is created in a family so that it can be influenced one way or the other by that family. So parents are the primary communicators of faith to our children. So the foundational work should be done by parents. But as they become teenagers, pre-teenagers, teenagers, of course, they begin to ask some questions themselves, whether they verbalize those questions or not. Because of the exposure, they want to question some things. So it is fine if they question those things. You know? So at that point, we try to give them space. It's not only for faith. You know? We try to give them their space, let them make their decisions you know, themselves. But the underlying principle is that when you've done the foundational work, whatever decision they take at that level, you know, the underlying thing, sometimes things go wrong, you don't get me. But when things go wrong, if you've done your job well, they will still be drawn back to your faith. You know, they will take the faith as 
you know, not the faith of their fathers, but their own faith. Now, let me just give one example because of time. And it is an example of the prodigal son in the Bible. Of course, there are some values the father had, but he left the house. I mean, that must have been shattering for the man. Took his possession, went with his friends on a routers journey. But the Bible said at some point he came to himself, you know. Then he remembered some of the things, you know, his father's um, engagement with his laborers. That look, even the laborers, they have a better deal than my father. He must have remembered that, look, this man showed me love, you know. So he said, I will arise and go back to my father, you know. And that was what he did, despite the fact that he had that very long interview. So yes, back to this question, they will, some point, they will question some things, even about the faith. They will question some things about, I mean, the belief. But at the end of the day, you know, and when they begin to question those things, don't be antagonistic, don't fight them. Go to your knees and begin to pray, you know. We're going to pray for God to reveal, you know, himself to them. You know, begin to pray that they have that encounter with God himself. You know? So don't cause it to, uh, don't, how would I put it? Don't make too much of an issue out of it. So far they are safe. You know, we've had children that tell their parents they are not going to church anymore. You know, so rather than uh, fight them, fight on your nails. You know, and um, that's what I like to say for them. If that has answered the question. Yes, it does. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll go back to Sister Chinere. I believe her mic is uh, open now. So, Sister Chinere, when is the right time to start the conversations? Okay, thank you so much. Sorry for the delay. The, I needed the host to unmute me. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Bratunde. Um, well, from all we've had and uh, from experience too were to start conversation as early as possible uh, if i recall correctly when uh, duchess was talking she mentioned from 18 years yes i mean from 18 months that's when the child is aware of the surroundings as early as possible you start with the appropriate you know uh, you start um, a conversation with the ch with the child or the children according to their age because there are different conversations you make you you put across according to the, the their age but the earliest should be from you know one what i mean one and a half years old because by then they are getting used to their environment they are trying to interpret things at that age you start but then you have to be tactful about it you know to know how you are going to you know communicate with the with the children each child has peculiarities that you also have to be mindful of some children are late starters some children are early starters but you know, bottom line is that from one and a half years old, you start. And as you progress, you keep, you know, going back to whatever that needs to be uh, told that child or the children. Every family has their different, uh, their different, um, what will I say now? Yes. There are different peculiarities, yes. So according to that, you watch as parents, you watch, listen to your children, and then you can pass across whatever or have your conversation with them. Like the Bible said in uh, 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 Deuteronomy chapter 6 from verse 6, where he said, at, at meal times, when you're walking, when you're chatting, waking up, going to bed, these are times for conversation, and then you know you give whatever you have to say to your children. But the earliest should be from one year and one year and a half when that when they are aware. Thank you. 
Yeah, from that age, when they are aware, one to one and a half, um, don't yeah. mute yet, I'm still with you. Um, okay. Um, we know that at that time, they will listen to anything you have to say and they will be open to what you have to say. But yes. you also mentioned children have peculiarities, you know, yes. and when they get older, if you have a child that is not open to a particular line of conversation that you consider important, should you let it go or how do you approach such situations? If that child is now older and is not open to that particular line of conversation? Well, even though the child might not be open at that time, you know, you still have to be patient, but you revisit it. You don't say, you don't leave it up because at that time he or she wasn't ready. You still have to go about, you know, be patient and try other ways of how you can get that child's attention. You know, training up a child while in the course of training the or living, I mean, uh, bringing up children, you will find out that you have to ap apply different you know, methods and tactics on how to get across your information, you know, and most especially for those of us, for we that are Christians, you ask the help of the Holy Spirit. You know, the, the Holy Spirit of God is the spirit of wisdom. He will give you, guide you, you know, in the way that you should, the best way to approach such, you know, uh, situations. Because uh, sometimes when children are not, you know, averted to hearing or paying attention to what you're saying. It might be a combination of different things at that time. So you watch, if you have tried how much you know how you can get through to that child and you haven't been able to still get through to that child, you don't say you leave it off. You just approach the Holy Spirit of God. And I know he will definitely give you the right approach to that and you'll be able to reach that child we just have to um, you know engage the holy spirit because he's he's our helper he will give you the help on how to approach that yeah thank you thank you very much sister runke dr runke akiola on the issue of identity and purpose does identity stroke purpose change over time Thank you, Boss Sunday. Identity remains the same. And so, so, remember, the Bible tells us that the gift and calling of God, they are without repentance. So, once we have them, we have them. Our identity is what it is. What changes, however, or what gets modeled, you know, over time is our discovery. Is our discovery. So, we have to discover them. So, is the discovery that is a process. So for example, you may uh, identify with one purpose for time and you know, work with that purpose and you work with it for a long time. And then as things unfold, as you work with God more, as you are more exposed to other people, other experiences, your eyes get opened and you may discover, oh, okay, I think I sense God is asking me to do something else at this point in time. Has your purpose no, you have only added, you know, to the discovery. So, yes, discovery is always mm -hmm. ongoing and will continue to go on until the day we go to this point. <laughs> but does it change? No, it doesn't. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, I perceive Sister Ronke letting us know that the, 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 because of what she has said, parents have to continue to be vigilant and observant so that, as she said earlier, that we're supposed to guide our children. We ourselves must be vigilant to look out for those changes that are happening, those additions that are coming in, so that if we have, if we have tried to guide them in a certain direction and there is fresh revelation of other attributes, other gifts, we can try to guide them to be able to activate those gifts as well. Thank you very much. Uh, in the same line, I would like to ask uh, Brother Tony Sawyer, well, that Tony Sawyer, are you with us? Yeah, I'm very much here. Okay, so if your child perceives a purpose that you don't agree with at that time, how should you handle it and whose opinion should count more? You know, I ask this question from a point of... Uh, I, I feel a bit... I mean, my parents did 
fantastically well. And uh, I will always be grateful to them. But if there is one area where I don't agree with them, it's that it was highlighted by something that happened earlier this week. You know, when I was in school, when I was a young teenager, I was really into football and I liked football a lot. And this week, when I learned that Lionel Messi is now on a salary of about $1 million per week, I thought back to those days when my parents didn't allow me that gift of football that I had. They did not allow me to harness it. So in, what would you say to today's parents about if you have a disagreement with your child on where their gifts and their purpose lies? Okay, thank you uh, very much, Brother Sunday. And of course, all these, I mean, the, the speakers, the two uh, great speakers that we had today, awesome. Uh, it was actually an eye opener. Uh, coming to the question, um, as a parent, one thing that we've come to learn and we need to appreciate the fact that we are only custodians uh, to these children at different stages of their life. Um, by the time a child will begin to uh, disagree with you about his purpose, her purpose, that child is already probably a teenager. Before that age, they are still um, malleable. They are still uh, subjective to your opinion, so to say. But in their teenager years, we've come to learn, particularly what I've learned in, this, in, in, in parenting skills from School of Parenting, uh, is that at that age, those, those kids are now your friends. Now, they can take an advantage of your experience in life. And if we have learned to make them friends, not uh, boss and um, subordinates now, it, it would be quite easy to share your experience uh, with them and make them to take advantage of what you have gone through in life. Of course, they are not supposed to be uh, another avenue to leave out what we didn't leave out when we are their age, but rather an opportunity to help them see things from a mature perspective. Now, as friends, we want to give them that opportunity to also explore by themselves. So if they are not persuaded by what I believe should be, Having uh, done my best to explain, I will always resort back to the person who controls him and co or controls my child and controls myself, who has, an, uh, who has a greater influence over the two of us, which is God, of course. And I'll lay the matter down there. I say, Lord, this child is thinking this way. And I'm thinking this way. Let your will and your wish prevail here. If what I'm saying is correct and is right, I mean, you have the ability to convince him. And of course, if I'm not too hard on such a child, and uh, the child will come back and say, look, dad, I'm thinking otherwise again. Permit me in one minute to share an experience, which is very germane here. When our first son got into Unilag, um, he started with geophysics as a course. Of course, he was a science student in secondary school. And um, um, we are aware that he didn't have the opportunity of uh, uh, including further maths in his subjects in the secondary school examinations. He didn't his school didn't have a teacher for that. And so he, 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 he graduated without further maths. Uh, but because he had, you know, he was a core science student, he wanted to do science. So he was admitted for geophysics along the line. And then when he started, ah, it was a turbulent one for him. The, 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 the subject further maths was required to gain admission. But when the lecture started, further maths began to show up. And he began to struggle. I remember the day he called me and they said he's changing his course in the, in the university. I was thrown, I was thrown <laughs> off my guard. And I was like, change your course, why? Of course, I knew of the result that he has actually uh, gathered along the line. They weren't too good, really. But I felt that with more effort, he could do better. Of course, I was coming from a science background myself. So I was like, you are becoming lazy here. I wanted to be hard on him. The next time I met him again, he wasn't looking happy. He was like struggling. But while I was arguing with him there on the campus, my spirit said, why not listen to him? So I said, okay, son, what do you want to do if you are changing your course? Luckily for him, the only course he could change to was social science. And I said, social science, from science to social science, 
you didn't do arts in school. He said, I've checked the qualification. I've checked everything. And I'm, I'm interested in, in psychology. Maybe you're not even really interested in psychology, but just to escape science. Long story cut short, my spirit said, let him do what you know he would like to do. Moreover, he's struggling with that course. I gave him all the backing. My wife to say, let's leave him to go do what he would like to do since he wants to do it. He changed eventually, but he lost a year. But one thing that was gratifying to me was that I saw a change in him that he was not happy with himself. He was coping with the course. And the very first exam he did in that faculty, which was not uh, where he actually had his subjects in secondary school, he did fantastically well. The results were amazing. I was, I was happy that I didn't, I didn't go ahead with the typical, I'm your father, you must do this, you must do that. So asking your question is that uh, we, will, we will always love to give them that opportunity to express themselves and we are not persuaded with your own conviction. We hand them over to God and of course, God will make all things well in the course of time. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Brother Tony. The next question I have is on the subject of sexuality. I'll come back to a comment that Sister Ronke made, even though my question is not directed to her, but I could not help but wish she could demonstrate to us when she told us that her dad taught her how to walk, how to catwalk. I added the catwalk by myself, but she was <laughs> describing she was describing how her dad showed her how to walk, and she said she wished she could show us. In my mind, I was also wishing she could actually, I was visualizing her old dad showing her how to walk and look like, walk properly like a lady. But my question on that subject is um, directed to Opoyemi, Opoyemi Arowolo. Um, Sister Ronke mentioned that driving age is 16 in some places, it's 18 in some places. And she used that driving example to illustrate how you should not, you should encourage your children to wait for the right time before getting involved in, in sex. So my question to you is, when is the right time? How, you are a counselor, you counsel students from school to school, from place to place. What would you say is the right time in terms of guiding the children? Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, in respect of that, I think, and which I know is that when it comes to sex, sex is actually made for married couples. When you're married, that's when you should actually be able to have sex because it comes with all manners of things that the teenagers might not be ready for. And I have a teenager, I have a um, I am um, a 18 year old boy. So, and when he clocked 18 in June, I told him, young man, you have your free because he's even out of the house. He does everything by himself, spends money, now knows how life is outside there. And I told him that being 18 does not guarantee that should go around having sex or doing some things that is rated at from 18 upwards. I made him realize what the consequences are. In respect of sex, we need to tell our children, we should need to let them know who and who is meant to have sex. We need to let them know that there's some issues they can't even handle. Because I was joking with him, I said, eventually you need to take care of your life and you have sex and she becomes pregnant. What will you do? And he was looking and he was like, I don't even have time for that. And I probably don't even think about that. But I told him that at times you don't want to think about some things and it comes up. So in respect of that, we should be able to tell our children that even when you're 18, we should be able to know better, to know how to abstain from sex. You know, you know, these days we have our children getting married earlier than the usual, some get married at 25, 24, then they can do whatever they want to do. Because now, even it's not just about the age 18. The moment those children leave secondary school, they feel they can do anything, you know, 
obviously, yes, paint their nails, do this and that. And they feel I'm out of home, I'm in the university, and I can just do whatever I want. I always ask them, even when I talk to some young adults, I said, having sex, yes, you have the hormones, the raging, you want to have sex. Are you ready to bear the consequences that comes with it? It's not just about the, the issue of being pregnant alone. It's the, the, the issue of you have sex with someone and the person, you have sex with someone and the person breaks up with you, especially for the ladies. The moment they have sex with someone at that age and the person breaks up with them, they feel so bad as in, you know, why does he have to? But notice that when they don't have sex with someone and the boy breaks up with them, it's not that they don't feel, it's not that they feel happy. They don't feel happy, but much is not taken away from them like when they pass sex with them. So I always encourage them that you need to wait till when you are married. It might not be so easy. And I always tell them to that, adventure may be something leads to something and you have sex. You need to ask you, yourself the question, what will happen the next year? Because it's so rampant now that even from 18, you find lady, get, get, um, ladies from 18, they tend to have abortion now. I'm telling you, most parents don't know. They have abortion first, second. And I asked them, you have the first one, you had sex, and it was a mistake. And the second one, you had sex, you are, you are pregnant, you are aborted. The second one comes in. Are you not able to sit down to ask yourself, what is in line for me? What should I do? What should I not do? Should I still continue with this relationship, even if I have to continue with it? Do I necessarily have to have sex? So, you know, we need to guide our children to let them know that they should be able to wait till they are married because that's the best bet. You can't be there for them, but like I tell my children that in case it happens, you should be able to sit down and ask yourself what comes out with it. At times they might have sex and not be pregnant, but some other things comes up with it. You find them that even when they are not compatible when they're dating, just because they've had sex with someone, they feel, oh, I should still stay in this relationship. So I think well, because of time, that's what I would like to say. But for my children, I told them, there's one thing I told them when they were entering secondary school, and now that my son is out of secondary school and the other one's writing at SSC, I tell them that per venture, you have sex and for my mm -hmm. daughter and you get pregnant. Before you tell the boy, let me be the first person to know. I, might not, I won't be happy about it, but I'm going to be there for you and we are not going to abort it. And I told my son to that adventure, you have sex and a girl gets pregnant. Please, and you are sure you are the one. Please don't make the mistake of sending my away or something. Let me know. We are not saying you are going to marry. No, no, no. But let me know and we know the way forward. That's all I have for you. <laughs> now, Sister Koyemi, um, on yeah. this on this subject, right? I know many parents are they find it difficult to bring up that subject. You understand? I know men in particular they can be terrified to bring up the the topic with their girl child. You know? Do you have in in sixty seconds? Do you have any 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 tips to help parents on how to broach the subject to make it easier for both them and their children to have that conversation firstly you have to be confident about it and secondly when you're going to discuss with them it's not when an issue comes up that you discuss with them you discuss with them when nothing is on ground for them maybe they're just what they are doing nothing and you're in good mood you start with your own experience and when i mean experience not something about the good just talk about your teenage days you love in being some topics of that are funny. And with that, you begin to talk about the boy and girl relationship and some other things. And you're able to tell them about sex, um, every other thing that has to do with it, depending on the age of your child. And that's what I'm, and one thing about this issue is that when they ask you questions, please don't shy away from it. Be able to open up to them where you've made your mistakes. I told my children about my crush. I told them about even in the crush I had in secondary school and some other things. And they'll be like this because they are now age appropriate. 
and we'll really be talking about it. So you have to be confident and come up with your own experiences. One thing I noticed about experiences is that they want to listen. Whether it's a bad experience or a good experience, they want to listen. And with time, they'll go back and think about it. And that helps them. And when you're true with them, just keep on, you know, but always do it in a very friendly atmosphere. Not when something comes up okay. that you bring up that issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dean, talking about family values, um, if you have well-crafted family values, in what practical ways do you get the children to buy into them? Because sometimes parents can have these well-crafted family values, but the children do not necessarily buy into them. How do you get the children to buy in? Okay, thank you, Bobby. You see, <laughs> the family values are not crafted by the parents. That's not the idea. You know, everybody come up with their own values. What we did in our family, we all had these various. We had a meeting for our two days here. Yeah? You know, so the so everyone came up with their own values. We we talk extensively on what values are. So then we looked at the ones that are similar. You know, so we highlighted those ones. That are similar. That is, we all believe in those values. Then we now had the family vision. We had the mission statement. Then we pick the things that run across. You know all these things. You know, and that's from there we got our family values. So everybody, you know, subscribed to that. It wasn't that we imposed it. Parents should not impose values. It should be things that you know evolve you know, from interaction with the children. So everybody took ownership. We should take ownership of it. That's the thing. So it should be something that we all subscribe to. So having been doing that, you know, it was easy for everybody to follow through, not just for the parents, but it was also easy for the children. And again, what we like to remind ourselves, if you see someone doing something contrary to what, you have to say, oh, no, you shouldn't have done that. Or you should have done that. Or you didn't do it, you know, the way it should be done. Things like that. I hope that's all it, you it, it does. It does. And uh, to be absolutely honest with you, that was the direction I was sure you would, uh, you would go. And someone, a participant asked that um, can, can expectant couples craft values before the children are born? Yes, it can. But that is their values, you know. But when the children, of course, that is the values we teach the children. But when they get to a point, you know, you want to involve them. You know, children don't like it when it is yours. You know, they want it when things evolve because again, they want to be treated as individuals. You know, and that is the way it should go. Yes, you can have it as couples, you have your values, fine. And your values will reflect in the way you train those children, fine. But you will find out that when you have those values, you will likely come up with similar values. Your children will likely come up with similar values. You know, I mean, uh, values that are similar to yours when you have this type of interaction because they are already familiar to the value. For example, you know, tell your children, do not lie. And you are not lying, and um, you've not even said family values. Because you say it again, again, and again, and the children are already toying that line. You find out that, that honesty will come top, you know, in their family values. So they both buy into it. You know. Okay, let me give this example. Uh, one day we were at a children's school. At that time, three of them were in body house, the same body house. Was it three of them or two of them, right? I'm not sure where three, but they were in the body now. So we had interaction with the principal. So one thing led to the other. But talking about our faith, you know, before they left the house, while they were still very young, we take Wednesday off as our family prayer and fast day. You know, and we did that consistently till they went off to secondary school. But we never, you know, mentioned it to them or instructed them to pray, I mean, to fast on Wednesdays while they're in school, because we know you're under a different regulation. So we didn't tell them. But it was very gratifying for the principals to say, we know the Adibar children. On Wednesday, 
they will fast and they will take time out to pray. Man, that was, you know, I, I mean, it was very gratifying for me because we, so my wife and I, we looked at ourselves. We didn't impose it on them. We didn't tell them to do it. But they internalized it. They went out of the house, you know, into another environment, and they still kept faith, you know, with that. So that's the thing. That's the way it works. So it wasn't what we imposed. It was what we all agreed, you know, and it was easy for them to follow through. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next question on service is going to Sister Chinyere. So Sister Chinyere, talking about service, rendering service goes against the natural grain of an average young child, right? The, their natural grain is to, it's me, myself, and I. They want, to, they want to have everything. They want the world to be at their service. But teaching them to, to, to render service is something that doesn't come naturally to them. Is it okay to incentivize the service at the beginning or will this amount to giving a bribe? Sorry? Oh, yeah, okay, yes. Um, to incentivize, uh, I would say it's like putting the cat before the horse. In teaching them, just like the scripture that we started, we train up a child in the way he should go. You see, when you're bringing up children, you let them know the, the, the importance of service. Like, likewise, so many other things, you know, you let them know. Giving them examples, you being their role model, will help them understand that they should do this. They should render service. They should also applaud others who render services. Like we said, be, gr be grateful when somebody renders a service to you. I'm sure the service, whoever, whether mommy, daddy, or the words around them, render them service, they'll find out that it's comforting to them. So if they learn that and see that, you don't now have to, you know, in give them incentives to do service. Like you said, I know that generally they wouldn't like to do what they are supposed to do or render service ordinarily. But then by the time you lead by example, and then they see how good, how gratifying it is to them when they are rendered services. They will have no choice but to try to take it in. It will be, it will be a, a gradual process for some. For some other people, it might take, for some other children, it might take some time. Like I said earlier, children differ and all that. But then it's not you know, a must that you should give the incentive first to teach them service. But then when they do certain things and render services, you on your own could now decide to just, you know, give them something, applaud them and say, okay, for this, I'm giving you this gift because of what you did the other time. But not that I would give you this before you do it. That's like putting a cat before the horse. Before the horse. So what I'm saying in summary is that don't give the put the incentive first before they do the service. Rather, train them, let them know that giving service brings, you know, something, you know, and then they will be able to also learn that, especially when they have been rendered services and they have been, you know, they have been uh, happy or they have taken that, you know, with joy and seen that it was good for them. So they will learn that. Thank you. Okay, uh, while I still have you, let me also ask you a question on finances. Um, okay. Uh, are there any early warning signs that, indirect early warning signs that a parent can use to, to gauge that this child is not being financially frugal, frugal or prudent? You know, uh, for example, when I was growing up, yeah. my mom used to take exception to a child eating the meat before eating the food. You understand? <laughs> and what she yeah. used to say then is, if you eat your meat before your food, you will not know how to spend money. You are going to be, you, are, you won't be prudent. You are going to be prodigal with money. So do you believe, are there any early warning signs that you think you can, can you correlate? Is there a correlation between some little things that a child does that may point to that child's uh, at, attitude towards financial management? Well, again, <clears throat> 
um your your own example is quite is quite peculiar i might say and it's not like that because we know you to be somebody who is very you know good in fact when we are talking about finances we always reach out to you to do so because they didn't allow me to eat the meat or that's it's, it's, don't say it doesn't I work. Know, they didn't I allow know, me to eat the meat until I finish the eba. Yes, I know. I know. Yes, because of the example you gave, that's why I gave that, so that we know that others know that you are the boss when it comes to teaching finances. Okay, that's by the side. Actually, when bringing up children, you know, like we do, we study our children while bringing them up. As we study them, we we'll be able to look out for, you know, certain signs. There are some children that they are, they are, it's not like they, they, they would want to be spent thrift or just, you know, throw away lavish money and all that. But then there are some things that they could do in handling money that will be a telltale sign. Like there was one of my children that I sent some time to go buy something. And when he bought it, they, they didn't have change. And he was like, he left the change there. <laughs> and came home. And I'm like, so where is your change? He said, they didn't have change there. Huh? So what happened? He said, that he left it there. I said, what? How? How? I was so, you know, I wasn't happy. You see, that, if that child isn't corrected, I had to explain to him that, see, you are going to pay with your money for that change you left there. And that will help him understand that you don't just leave it. That's not, I can't say because he did that, it's natural, it's natural in him to throw away. He has to learn. You have to teach. You look out for these things and then you go ahead and correct so that that child can learn about finances. So in terms of finances, children, we should just be a guide to them, you know, helping them, send them, go and buy, look at what you're doing, try to calculate it and all that, especially at the age uh, an age appropriate time. Not just you send a two-year-old to go with the 1,000 naira to go buy something and then he, loses, he or she loses the money and you're like, why? So what I'm actually saying in essence is that children, as we bring them up, we also study them and then know how we are going to you know, guide them in the area of finances. There's, every child has the wisdom you know, to be good with finances, but then you have to also do your bit about training them and guiding them to use it well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our time is fast spent, so we need to round up. Um, okay. I'll just ask two quick questions and I, I request uh, quick answers. And uh, the next question on safety and security will go to Dean. No, it will go to Opsi. I just had a remark here for Dean. When Dean mentioned about um, uh, high heels being left around uh, in the house, I would just uh, advise Dean to go and read Habakkuk 3.19 <laughs> to understand, to understand uh, Madame's behavior. Uh, and Habakkuk 3.19 says, The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high heels. So I believe Madame must have read that, and she, she, she enjoyed wearing the high heels uh, to, 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 to conform to Habakkuk's uh, instructions. So, uh, Opsi, um, on safety and security, and briefly, please, what should you discuss with kids about banditry and kidnapping, given the environment that we have these days? In terms of safety and security, in, in what areas do they need to be aware and to be alert? And what habits do they need to avoid with regard to the current issue in Nigeria regarding banditry and kidnapping? Okay, um, they should be aware that when they're walking on the road, either on the streets, on the main roads, when they see vehicles, they should be cautious of vehicles that try to stop by their sides. You know, whether they're parking or they're just slowing down, they should be cautious because some can open the doors and drag them. And the issue of not talking to, they should be aware of who to talk to. Even when they're 18 years old and they know, you know, we say don't talk to strangers, they should be cautious. You know, you have to look at people around you they are they should be cautious of how they move and how they do things you know because you, it's not written on the forehead would they talk even when they go out to buy things and they realize that people are 
know, gesticulating in a manner that they don't feel comfortable or they're passing things around, they need to be cautious of that. And I really want to say something about the car issue because it's common these days. I see it every day. You find students going on the road and they're going home and you find cars parked by the sides and they still keep on talking there with some guys around. They might not be kidnappers, but they need, we need to get them that when you see people like that, you need to move away. And you need to tell them that, um, you know, and realize that even uh, our children get carried away when they are moving on and the car just stops, they wind down, please, um, what I'm going to number so, so, so. You need to tell them that it's not for them to answer. But for the older ones, they can use their discretion, maybe 18 and above. They can use their discretion whether to, whether to answer or not. And you have to let them realize that at the same time that it's not everybody that can do that. At the same time, it's not written on the forehead. Let them open their, uh, their eyes. And those that doesn't go with, that doesn't go on the road, even on your streets, they need, because right now, I have a security group I belong to within 10 meters, um, you know, we, we, you realize that a child cannot be seen again. So even on the, on the streets, you need to teach them how to go and buy things, how to walk, what to watch out for. Parents know much about that. Please don't hold back anything to save them. You know, we need to help them because children are being kidnapped every day. And they should be cautious, you know, even when they are at home. It's better to speak through the door when somebody knocks on the door rather than opening the door and face them. Right now, they use, I think they use chloroform. Before you talk, they put something on your face or they spray something to you. So tell them that they shouldn't open the doors for people, you know, because they use all manners of tactics to get into your house. And most especially as security men. I have one too, but I've given my children all the guidance. They are security men at home. But we need to be cautious when they notice some things and not to be, and I can't use the word too friendly, not to be too trustworthy and not to trust them so much that this person cannot harm me. Okay, thank you very much. We have many other questions we can get to. So please, if we didn't get to your question, um, you can go to our Telegram group and ask the question there and we will try to answer other, to answer all those questions. So Finally, I would just ask Sister Ronke very briefly with regard to gratitude, which is the last question, and I trust she will answer in less than a minute. Gratitude is one of those uh, manners you want to attribute, you want to bring up in your child. It goes with other things like uh, saying please, saying thank you, saying excuse me, and those things. And is there a place for enforcing gratitude? If a child is apparently not getting that memo, is there a place for enforcing that habit of gratitude? Thank you, Bertundi. Um, the place for enforcing the gratitude is still conversation and bringing it to their mind every time and every, you know, the opportunity arises. So uh, as you have said, gratitude is the parent of all virtues. So a child wakes up in the morning, you should greet the parent. You know, a child receives a gift the other day, the day before from anybody, then the parents, the, the, the honest lies on the parents, so if I'm the one who gave the child the gift, I should say, did you thank me? Did you remember to thank me for what I gave you or what I did yesterday? You know, because if you continue to remember to thank me as your mom, then anybody who gives you anything, you will remember to thank them. If it is thank you notes, encourage them to give thank you notes. If it is uh, taking up the phone to have a conversation to say thank you, then encourage them to do so. And then even for simple mundane things, you know, I helped you to clean your room a little bit. I helped you to wash your clothes or something. Or I even cook food that you ate. You should, you know, say thank you. And we can enforce this by giving them nuggets. Have you thanked me for X, Y, Z? Have you greeted me for X, Y, Z? And things like that. So that's how we can enforce that. Thank you. This brings us to the end of our interactive session. And from the depth of my heart, to all our panelists, I say a very big thank you. Thank you very much for all you have um, to our main speakers, Brother Dayo Adebayo and Sister Ronke Akiola for all the wonderful teachings, all the nuggets of knowledge you've dropped and for our panelists who came to flesh things up. So thank you all very much. Our, our meeting is not over, it is almost over. 
So I'll call on Brother Patrick Ayao to quickly give us um, the prayers. So let's pray together. Our dear Father, we want to thank you, God, for this special opportunity you've given us to talk together, to reflect, to think, to weigh issues concerning the children you have given us. Uh, for those uh, who have children, for those who have uh, words they're taking care of, for those uh, who are looking forward to having children to take care of. Lord, we ask, O oh God Almighty, that the things we have learned today, the 10 conversations we need to have with our children, and much more that you whisper in our hearts. Lord, we ask, O oh God, may they not fall to the ground in Jesus' name. Lord, we also thank you, God Almighty, for those celebrating different things this month of August, bad days, wedding anniversaries, and all. Lord, we ask, O oh God Almighty, that you bless, that you bless each one in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Egino Father. Thank, thank you, King Eterna. Keep our families, keep our children, keep us, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can we share the grace together? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the swift fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Surely, Amen. God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you all again for joining. We apologize for overrunning our time today. It is not in our habit, but I'm sure we are all blessed. Thank you very much. Join us again second Saturday of next month and second Saturday of every month. Thank you. God bless you. Have a lovely rest of the month. Bye.